Welcome to this presentation on LM Potencies and Healing. My name is Willa Kaiser. I'm the director of the Caduceus Institute. And I've been using LM Potencies myself for over 30 years. Um, I started using them right away when I was a student of homeopathy back in the very early 90s. Um, and I read the sixth edition of the Organon and sounded pretty good to me. So I uh, started using them right off right off the bat in my practice and uh, have continued to use them. So I'm happy to be sharing them with you today. I think many of you are already familiar with the Organon and you may know that Hahnemann rewrote the Organon six times and uh, LM potencies were not described until the sixth edition of the Organon. But already during the fifth edition of the Organon, Hahnemann was already convinced <clears throat> that remedies should be put in water. And I want to read you a quote. This is actually from Chronic Disease um, in 1837. Hahnemann said, Experience has shown me, as it has no doubt also shown to most of my followers, that it is most useful in diseases of any magnitude to give to the patient the powerful homeopathic pellet or pellets only in solution, and the solution in divided doses. In this way, we give the medicine dissolved in four to eight ounces of water without any addition. In acute uh, and very acute diseases every six, four, or two hours, when the danger is urgent, even every hour or half an hour, a tablespoon at a time. Uh, weak persons or children, only a small amount of a tablespoonful may be given as a dose. In chronic disease, I have found it best to give a dose, e.g. a spoonful of a solution of the suitable medicine at least every two days, usually more every day. So by this time, Hahnemann was already saying remedies really should be put in water. They're much better that way. And we're going to get into some of the reasons why. Then um, Hahnemann finally finished his uh, sixth edition of the Organon, which he considered to be his, the most nearly perfect of all. So he worked, was, was, he was a constant, uh, scientist and always trying new things and experimenting and seeing what he thought would work best. And he really felt that the, uh, these new potencies that he had developed were the most nearly perfect. Uh, a little bit more from this quote on, in paragraph 246. He said, what I said in the fifth edition of the Organon in a long footnote to this paragraph with the purpose of preventing these untoward reactions of the vital force was all that my experience permitted me to say at that time. But for the last four or five years, thanks to the modifications by which I have perfected previous procedures, all these difficulties have been completely removed. The same well-chosen medicine can now be given daily even for months if necessary. In the treatment of chronic disease, if the lower degree of potency is used up in one or two weeks, one proceeds in a similar way to a higher degree. The new method of dynamization to be explained later, the medicine is administered beginning with the lowest degrees. So he really had a big change in how he wanted uh, to prepare remedies and how he uh, saw so few really had a reduction in the aggravations uh, once he started using LM potencies, which is why he developed them. So in paragraph 47, he goes into um, how you really need to change the potency every time you use it. He says, it is inadmissible to repeat even once exactly the same dose of medicine without modifying it. And in this case, it's modifying through succussion, let alone many times. The vital principle does not accept such identical doses without opposition, i.e. without bringing out other symptoms of the medicine, symptoms not similar to those of the disease being treated. 
The previous dose has already completed the transformation of the vital of the vital principle expected of it, and a second unmodified dose of the same medicine, identical in degree of dynamization, is consequently no longer able to work exactly the same effect upon the vital principle. Now the patient can only be made sick in a different way by such an unaltered dose, basically more sick than before, because now only the, the only symptoms left to act are the medicinal ones that are not homeopathic to the disease. Therefore, no progress toward cure, but only a real aggravation of the case can result. So basically he's saying, not only do you need to put it in water, but you also need to change the potency slightly each time, basically by succussion, or else you're going to cause aggravations. So he says, but if one slightly modifies the potency of each new dose by dynamizing it to a somewhat higher degree, the, vital, the sick vital principle allows itself to be altered further by the same medicine without ill effect and thereby be brought nearer to cure. So uh, he's emphasizing these two points, basically that remedies should be put in water and that also you should never give the same uh, dosage exactly the same, that you need to modify the potency, which would be by succussion. Now in paragraph 48, he goes into a little more detail and talks about potentization and succussion, what we call succussion. For this purpose, the medicinal solution is potentized anew each time before it's taken with about eight, 10, or 12 succussions of the bottle. Now, uh, as we might, we'll talk about later, that many succussions for sensitive people um, may be too many. And this is what the real beauty of working with LM potencies is that uh, you're able to uh, really adjust according to the sensitivity of the person. Uh, the patient should take one or increasing pro progressively more coffee spoons or teaspoons of this as follows. In chronic disease, daily or every other day. In acute diseases, every six, four, three, or two hours, et cetera. So this is similar to what he had said in that earlier quote from chronic diseases. So basically, LM potencies are good for giving as a daily dose um, or every other day, although in acute conditions, you can do it uh, more often, and that the remedy should always be potentized or succussed in between doses. Now, why did um, Hahnemann feel that he needed to make a change um, and start developing these other potencies? What he was finding was that uh, with C potencies, probably do, according to him, to the amount of succussions that are in a C potency, that C potencies tend to bring about aggravations. So if you think about, if you know how um, C potencies are made, where 100 drops, uh, one drop of the tincture to 100 drops of water, then it's succussed a bunch of times, and then you do that again, succussed a bunch of times, then you do that again, you know, to get up to, for example, a 30 C. Um, you would be doing that 30 times. Whereas with LM potencies, you're using um, a little bit of substance and much more water and fewer succussions. So in paragraph 270, uh, Hahnemann describes this and says, according to my earlier instructions, a whole drop of liquid in the lower potency always had to be added to 100 drops of wine spirit for further potentization. But meticulous experiments have convinced me that this ratio between the quantity of the dilutant and that of the medicine being dynamized, i.e. 100 to 1, is far too low to develop the medicinal substance properly and to a high degree with a large number of succussion, succussions unless force is used. Whereas if one takes a single globule, a hundred of which weigh a grain, and dynamizes it with a hundred drops of wine spirit, then the ratio becomes 50,000 to one, indeed higher than that, because 500 of such globules cannot completely absorb one drop. So this is where the LM idea comes in. LM means 50,000. Actually, it should be a Q, which is why they're more properly called Q potencies 
but the idea is that the dilution uh, factor, instead of being one to 100, as in a C potency, is one to 50,000, um, because we're just using um, one drop on, um, uh, it, we're just using uh, one little glob globule of this 3C and put it into wine spirits, et cetera. Um, in this much higher ratio between dilutant and medicinal substance, a large number of succussions of the vial filled to two thirds with wine spirit can bring about a far greater development of power. When the ratio of dilutant to medicine is as low as 100 to one, if very many succussions are, as it were, forced into it by a powerful machine, we obtain medicines that, especially in the higher degrees of dynamization, act almost instantaneously, but with intense, even dangerous violence, particularly on delicate patients, without bringing about the permanent, gentle counteraction of the vital principle. But my new method produces medicines of the highest power and the mildest action, which, if well chosen, heal all the sick parts of the organism. Using these far more perfectly dynamized medicines, one can, in acute fevers, repeat the small doses of the lowest degrees of dynamization, even at short intervals, and with medicines of long action, such as belladonna. And in chronic diseases, one can best proceed by beginning the treatment with the lowest degrees of dynamization, and if necessary, continue to the higher degrees, which are increasingly strong, but always act gently. So this is another difference with LM potencies, um, is that we start with an LM1, then we go to an LM2, then we go to an LM3, rather than this jump that you have in the C potencies, a 6C, a 12C, a 30C, a 200C. Um, so Hahnemann himself said that he noticed these very violent aggravations on C potencies, so he decided to develop this new system, which has a greater um, dilution um, ratio of 50,000 to one instead of 100 to one. And that when you uh, do this and deliver it in water, you're free of aggravations. Another uh, characteristic of LM potencies is that the aggravation tends to come uh, toward the end of treatment. Sometimes this isn't always the case in practice, but um, aggravations with LM potencies are much milder than they are with C potencies, and they're much easier to control. There's so many different things you can do, and when, um, when I get into showing you the uh, how to make remedies, you can see that uh, you can basically play around with the number of succussions, with the number of uh, cups of dilution, um, there's, they're just uh, so flexible rather than giving a single dose of a high potency of a C and then just having to wait and see what it does. So in paragraph 280, uh, Hahnemann says, one continues to give a medicine as long as it continues to benefit the patient and does not give rise to any troublesome new complaints. And one gradually increases the dose until the patient, while feeling generally better, begins once again to experience one or more of his old original symptoms to a moderate degree. If the remedy has been modified each time by succussion and the very moderate doses have been gradually increased, this return of old symptoms indicates that cure is imminent and that the vital principle has almost no more need to be affected by the similar medicinal disease, meaning the remedy, in order to stop feeling the natural disease. And that, now more free of the natural disease, is beginning to suffer somewhat from a homeopathic medicinal disease, otherwise known as a homeopathic aggravation. So um, I've definitely seen both in practice. I've seen people who are sensitive and have had somewhat of an aggravation in the first few weeks of a remedy, but it usually passes quickly and they can e either stop taking the remedy for a while or um, put it in a second or third cup of water. Um, or use fewer succussions and, uh, and then, you know, get through it very quickly and very easily. So why isn't everybody using LM potencies? It's obviously a mystery um, because Hahnemann himself said that this was the best method and here's why, and uh, he was absolutely convinced. Well, the reason is, the sixth edition went missing for quite a while. 
And it's not exactly clear what happened. Uh, it had something to do with his um, wife, Melanie Hahnemann, who um, was with him at the time. Uh, Hahnemann had two wives. His first wife he had a bunch of kids with and then became, um, she died and he became a widower. And then um, Melanie came into his life. So this was really the most beautiful time of Hahnemann's life. Um, after Melanie came into his life, uh, this happened uh, when he was already 79 years old, if you can imagine. Um, Melanie at the time was 35 years old and she um, left Paris and uh, disguised herself as a man and traveled across Europe to meet Hahnemann. And at that time, he was already, as I said, 79 years old and almost a recluse. He became his, her, his patient, his student, and eventually his wife. And then they went uh, to Paris. She brought him to Paris, and these were really his golden years. He was very, very happy. She was the first woman um, to practice medicine openly in Paris. And the only woman who had worked as a, as a physician or a doctor of any kind at that time in Europe. Um, he was continuing to refine how he was practicing homeopathy and just kept experimenting. And this is when he developed the LM potencies. So they were together for about nine years. And after he died, she had the sixth edition of the Organon, and whether it had to do with <clears throat> her thinking that people would not accept the information or whether it had to do with some struggles that she had in terms of uh, getting somebody to publish it who would pay her what she thought it was worth, it's really unclear um, as to why the sixth edition did not come out. But most of the authors um, that we read had no access to the sixth edition, which is why they were working with these high C potencies. So it's kind of a pity that it took a while for this information to come out because for many reasons, um, today's world, I feel that LM potencies are really the potency we need to use. Um, they're gentle because they're in water. Uh, you can give them every day. So all of the, the radio waves we're exposed to through Wi-Fi and our cell phones, all the overstimulation of our nervous system so that we really need that gentle reminder from our remedy every day. Um, and we just all have too much on our plate. I don't think our nervous systems were really built to handle the amount of stimulation, whether it's electromagnetic stimulation from our cell phones and our devices, um, or whether it's uh, just the actual imagery that's always coming at us, um, we um, and the complexity of our lives uh, just really makes the outer world quite overwhelming. And LM potencies, you can take them every day. So you get that gentle reminder to your nervous system and to your vital force. Um, to come back into balance. So, I'm going to show you the traditional way of how to make an LM remedy from an LM pellet. An LM1 is a 3C. It's, uh, that's, that's what it is, that's how it's prepared. It's been triturated up to a 3C. Um, and then later, and then I'm going to show you how I do it, because I worked with these traditional LM potencies um, for several years in my first years of practice. And then I simplified. I think it was Robin Murphy who inspired me to simplify. And now I do it in a bit of a more simple way. So basically what you do is you take a bottle, probably better if it's an amber bottle, like a four ounce or an eight ounce bottle. And again, you could use as much water as you want. If it's a sensitive person, you might want to use eight ounces of water. If it's a less sensitive person, you might want to use four ounces. And you put in this um, 
let's say uh, three quarters of it um, would be distilled water and one quarter would be some kind of white alcohol. Um, I use vodka. You could also use Everclear, which is a bit stronger, but some kind of white alcohol like vodka, uh, which is easy to get and do it. And again, this, this percentage of alcohol to water can depend on the season. In summer when it's warm and you're in more danger of getting some kind of um, mold growing in your bottle, uh, you might want to put more alcohol in. Um, Hahnemann even mentions putting a piece of, black, of charcoal in there to keep the water clean. I, I've never heard of anybody doing that, but it's actually written in the organon if you want to take a look. So anyway, you've got your bottle, you've got it uh, three quarters, approximately three quarters distilled water, one quarter white alcohol. And then you put in, you've got your bottle of um, LM1 pellets and you take a pellet and traditionally you're supposed to put in just one pellet and then you put a pellet of the LM1 into um, the bottle. Then you can succuss it a few times. Be sure to label it. I have some labels and uh, a, a marker so that a permanent marker, so you don't, uh, when you drip on it, et cetera, nothing happens. So that's your bottle of LM1. Then for the dosage, you're going to take a cup and you're going to pour a teaspoon of the LM1 into a teaspoon, pour out a spoon, and put it into a cup of, a, of about, you know, a half cup of water and then stir it. And then you take one dose and that's your dose. So that is your traditional LM1 potency. Now, uh, I mentioned that these are infinitely flexible. So one of the flexible ways, as I said earlier, is you can put it into um, eight ounces of water instead of four ounces. Same with when you get to this cup, you could do eight ounces instead of four ounces. But what is even more flexible is that you can take a spoon of this remedy and then put it into another cup, let's pretend this is cup number two, which has half a cup of water, and this is the second cup. And then if that's too strong, you can take a spoon of that one and go to a third cup and so on. And I've had clients who knew which cup they had to go to. Um, they would go, they would know that if they did the fourth cup, it was too strong, but the fifth cup worked for them. So there are people that are very sensitive and um, if you work with them this way, you can get to a point that they don't have any aggravations, but they're actually getting improvements from the remedy. So that is the traditional way that Hahnemann teaches to make an LM potency. Here's how I do it, <laughs> how I do it now. So instead of um, giving people remedies in um, uh, large bottles, I just use a four dram amber glass bottle. Um, I put um, the same kind of percentage of water, about three quarters water, one quarter vodka, and then I put in a pellet, or I sometimes put in a few pellets, uh, but you're supposed to only put one, but I like to put in a few um, pellets in there. Then I use this, which is um, an orifice re reducer. I used to use uh, droppers, eyedroppers, but when people are putting the eyedropper in the bottle and putting it in their mouth and putting it in the bottle and putting it in there in their mouth, it's a great way to get contaminated. So now I um, have switched to these orifice re reducers these past few years, except for my long-term clients who complain that they don't like them, that they want the dropper. <laughs> so I keep both in stock. So basically this um, orifice reducer goes on the top and you push it down in there. And then uh, again, label the remedy and then you can succuss it. So that's how I do it. And with this method, you can still go ahead and use a second and third cup. 
but in that case I use less water in the cups I just have people put you know an eighth of a you know a tablespoon or an, you know an eighth of a cup or so of water um, so that would be like one to three tablespoons of water and just uh, put a few drops of the remedy just tap the tap it the way these orifice reducers work is um, if you tap the bottom it comes out so uh, you can tell people you know to succuss their remedy however many times again uh, how many times they succuss the remedy will determine how strong it is so if it's somebody who is um, who is sensitive they might only succuss it two or three times i generally my my norm is five times um, but uh, you have them succuss it and then they can just drop the um, drops into their mouth two or three drops, or if they need to put it in water, they can um, just uh, put it into a cup. So that's how I do it. I didn't notice a big difference um, in how people responded when I started doing it this simpler way. It's easier to send people, because uh, I do a lot of online stuff. Um, it's easier to send people remedies this way. It's easier for them to take it, to not have to go through the rigmarole of cups and spoons and all that every time they want to take a dose of their remedy. So I think this is, um, it's, not, it's not a pure LM. I am using um, a 3C LM pellet, but I'm not preparing it in the way that it, the ratio would be exactly one to 50,000. So as I said, um, you can do, water is such a flexible substance and LM potencies are such a flexible system. Um, LMs work very deeply and very gently, uh, probably because more water is involved and fewer succussions. So the energy of the substance is able to have a more gentle effect rather than the, the violence of the succussions, which is quoting Hahnemann, as you now know, since I read to you from that quote from the Organon. So I wanted to talk a little bit about water as a receiver of energy, um, because, and this is now uh, going beyond what the Organon says, and I'm just going into some things that I think are important about healing um, and why you know, LM potencies work so well. So water is a recept is an energy receptor. This um, is an example here of I got this just out of a newspaper. This is just this is not anything you know out there strange. This is a fact that if you play a, a certain note on a piano, um, the surface tension of the water develops these different kinds of patterns. And we all know about the beautiful patterns that snowflakes make as well when water freezes. So water has a really incredible qualities of receiving energy, both sound energy, but also energy of intention. And these are some pictures based on the work of uh, the Japanese physician, Dr. Emoto, who did all that work about um, the power of intention on water. Um, the picture on the left is a picture of um, water crystal um, from a um, that's in a dam at Fujiwara, which is in Japan, and that was the before picture. And then after a Buddhist monk came and prayed, this is what the water looked like. So uh, not only can the vibrations of music um, and the vibrations of homeopathic remedies, but the um, prayer and intention are also um, very powerful and potent uh, and water is a, a receiver of those kinds of energies and a transmitter of those kind of energies as well. So my point in this is that our energy also counts when we talk about being a homeopathic healer or being any kind of healer our own level of compassion and caring, our own intention as we're making the remedies. Um, I, if I'm feeling sick or you know, out of balance or something, I do not make remedies. I kind of pick a time once a week uh, to make my remedies when I feel like my energy is good, my, I'm feeling positive, I'm feeling focused. That is really a time to do it. And um, 
that I, I believe that uh, just as energy goes into the water uh, from all these other ways, from the LM pellets and from music and from prayer, that we are also putting our energies into remedies as we're making them. So being ready to do that and, you know, developing our own compassion and our own healing um, energies is, is a really good way uh, to potentize yourself and potentize your remedies. So there are a lot of different ways people can approach healing. Uh, sometimes, you know, you might have sometimes been to an allopathic doctor who might have been really skilled at what he did, but he just didn't seem to have his heart in it. Um, and then it's kind of hard to connect and hard to trust, etc. cetera. Um, but um, other people really work on themselves from a place of humility, from a place of compassion, from a place of service. And I feel like these are the kind of qualities that are going to bring our energy forward as healers. Um, and there are practices that you can do um, to increase compassion and increase healing energy in yourself so that you can have as much as possible to offer others. So Hahnemann talks about the definition of healing in paragraph two of the Organon. He says, the highest ideal of therapy is to restore health rapidly, gently, permanently, to remove and destroy the whole disease in the shortest, surest, least harmful way, according to clearly comprehensible principles. So we're trying to restore um, an energy system back to its natural state of vibrancy and health. Uh, homeopathy, as you I'm sure know, is an energy medicine. And so uh, working with energies, we need to be aware that we're working with energies uh, with the energies in our clients and in our own energies as well. It's interesting because, you know, as you become more experienced talking to clients, a lot of times I can already, like if I'm talking, if a client calls and has a question about uh, how often they should take a remedy or something like that, uh, it's not like a follow-up, but they're just talking. And I can hear in their voice whether they're getting better or not. Um, there's some something that changes there's kind of like an extra resonance or more energy or more brightness i don't know how to describe it but you can hear it you can see it you can hear it um, and you can be attuned to it and you also of course need to do all of the traditional homeopathic things of writing everything down and, and evaluating and everything but you also um, can um, excuse me, I'm just stopping somebody's video here. You also uh, can use these other kinds of ways of perceiving what's going on uh, with a client. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the precursor to homeopathy. Um, maybe you have heard of Paracelsus. Paracelsus was a 16th century uh, physician and he was an alchemist. Uh, mostly because he was making his remedies using um, uh, plants and doing it according to astrology and preparing them in very specific ways to really extract um, the basically uh, the three parts of the plant and then put them back together again, which was a kind of pot way that he potentized plants. So um, he was working with the planets, with the stars, with the signatures of the, of the plants that he uh, chose to potentize. Uh, as an easy example, um, garlic, which um, of course is very pungent and is a great antibiotic, is associated with the planet Mars. And Mars is um, a planet of war and defense. So herbs like echinacea and garlic that are good for the immune system are associated with Mars. So we would, you know, he would make remedies associated with um, the planet to kind of strengthen their energies, things like that. So Hahnemann borrowed a lot of Paracelsus's ideas 
um, but never sourced them because Hahnemann was creating uh, what he wanted to consider, you know, a high-tech modern kind of science. Uh, he was, you know, like one of those people who would be in Silicon Valley, like right on the cutting edge of everything. And so he was not into sort of sourcing these old hermetic ways of doing things, even though he was using those methods. And if you want to learn more about this by reading a book, um, I put a book down here called The Life and Doctrines of Paracelsus by Franz Hartmann, who was a homeopath. And uh, that can give you a little bit of information if you're interested in the link uh, between uh, Paracelsian plant alchemy and homeopathy. So Paracelsus taught that sickness and health in the body relied on the harmony of humans and nature, the microcosm and the macrocosm, and that we can choose remedies accordingly. So you can imagine, you know, these days we are so out of whack with, the, with, with nature, how, you know, tuning into these kind of natural forces and planetary energies and the elemental energies of water and fire, et cetera, is a real way of uh, grounding and healing. So what I'm really talking about here is you know, being a, a holistic, vitalistic healer. Um, Hahnemann talks in paragraph six about the freedom from prejudice, being an unprejudiced observer. We talk about this a lot in case taking, how we really need to be able to see clearly um, what's going on with the person and not be shrouded by our own opinions or our own emotional reactions, how we would feel, you know, in that particular situation. And um, there's just so much phenomena that we have um, in terms of our own emotional states and the lens that we see uh, the world through to be able to really see somebody else clearly and be able to take their case from a place of real openness and real clarity. So I feel like anybody who does homeopathy needs to do this, whether it's from through prayer, through meditation, uh, through doing uh, practices in personal development. But I really feel strongly that um, all homeopaths need to do this to be able to really perceive the clients clearly and to be able to you know, put healing energy into what they're doing. Um, so Hahnemann mentioned it in terms of unprejudiced observer, et cetera. And uh, these days, you know, there are many different methods and ways, but it is the thing that I see after uh, 25 years of teaching, what I see that people really need to develop aside from learning the organon, learning Materia Medica, et cetera. They really need to focus on that personal development side. Um, and find a way to be that vitalistic healer, to be the unprejudiced observer, uh, to see the clients clearly, and to have a compassionate and energy of compassion and um, healing and service. So um, because of this, I did develop a sister program to the homeopathy school, um, which is at vitalism.us, which is a vitalistic healing program which goes into Paracelsian alchemy and meditation techniques um, and making remedies uh, the way that Paracelsus did from uh, plant material, uh, used doing that plant alchemy and also um, astrology as because uh, uh, Paracelsus actually said to be a healer, you need to be an astrologer as well and an alchemist. So we learn all of those. Now this kind of program is not for everybody, but I'm just mentioning it as an option for those who might be interested in exploring it further. And for people who have um, finished our first module, which um, uh, in the Caduceus, program, which is um, training in how to practice acute homeopathy, um, we founded the Homeopathy Compassion Network. And the purpose of this is to empower everyone in their own communities uh, to do outreach work with um, the homeless, with the underserved, um, 
perhaps in drug treatment programs, perhaps in foster care facilities. Um, there are many different ways that we can work with people who are going through crisis and helping them. And this would also include being ready to support each other through any kind of natural disasters that may be coming our way um, through climate change, such as wildfires, floods, et cetera. So we are interested in just coming together and um, people who already have um, a certain level of training, which would be in acute homeopathy, to be able to come together and be part of this group. We have some speakers lined up. Uh, we have a text that we're studying from. I'll show you the text. <laughs> we're just gonna start meeting soon. It's called uh, First Aid with Homeopathy. And uh, we're getting people who are uh, students in the Caduceus program um, are getting a discount on this um, from Homeopathic Educational Services. So uh, if this interests you, uh, we'd love to have you join us. And in our Caduceus homeopathic training program, we study the organon from start to finish. Um, it takes us about two years of, um, well, it depends on, the program is self-paced, so you could actually do it more quickly than that, but for people who are doing it as a part-time study, it, would, it might take up to two years or so to finish um, reading the organon. We go paragraph by paragraph, and so you really get a good understanding of what Hahnemann was teaching. Andre Sain said that as a student of homeopathy, you should read the organon twice a year, and as a practitioner, you should read it once a year. And I do have to attest that, you know, I, I recognize the profundity of Hahnemann more and more. <laughs> <laughs> the more I practice and the more um, experience I have, the more I really appreciate Hahnemann. He was a very brilliant man, and he was also a clear thinker, and he really was free from prejudice. He was willing to let go of his old ideas and try something new and see if it worked better than what he was doing before. So um, he's uh, really um, a very amazing uh, doctor for his time but not and but he was way beyond his time as well he was um, telling saying that uh, people who have mental illness should be pitied and shouldn't be beaten and put in chains which is what they were doing with them at that time they felt that they were possessed by demons and so they would be beaten and put in chains and he he said that they they should be treated with compassion so he was just way ahead of his time so clear minded in so many ways um, also, he was very suspicious of pharmaceutical companies and said a doctor should always make their own medicines. He was very adamant about that. So the whole thing of um, the pharmaceutical companies just being a big racket, you know, about making money and that not having anything to do with healing. Hahnemann was saying that back in the early 1800s. So, you know, we got to understand um, what an amazing visionary he was. So that's the end of that presentation. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, open this up for to see if anybody has any questions. So hold on just a sec. I need to unmute everybody, or at least give you a chance to unmute yourself. Let's see, allow participants to unmute yourself. Okay, does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? I'm seeing a bunch of people unmute. Anna, do you have a question? Anna Karina? Uh, no. No, okay. Shirley, do you, do you have a question? Yes, I do. I have a question about the LMs. When you're <laughs> taking an LM and you, it, the LM1, you know, you finish your bottle, um, but you need to take the LM1 again and you, so you, you're starting it anew. Mm -hmm. Is that, you're starting basically with what you started with in the beginning with the first one, is that a problem or doesn't it matter because you've succussed the other bottle every time you've taken it and then you start with a fresh one? 
Well, generally what we do is we go to an LM2. Um, I'm going to ask people to please stop. Do not start your video. Thank you. Okay, I keep stopping them and then people start them again. Um, well, generally, if you get to the end of a bottle, then you might be going to an LM2 at that point, in which case you would use some LM2 pellets or else you would make an LM2 from an LM1, which I can get, get to in another, um, another webinar, how you can take an LM1 pellet and turn it into an LM2 pellet or make LM2 pellets from an LM1 pellet. Does that make sense, Shirley? Well, it does, but I did have to keep going with an LM1 after I ran out of my first bottle, so. Okay, well, if you need to do that, you can just start again. Yeah, and it, 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 it will be a little different because it doesn't have all the succussions in it, but it should be fine. Okay, so have thanks. Patients, I have clients who stay on the same potency for years. And I just keep sending them the same potency. You know, I have somebody on an arsenicum LM10. The 11 is too strong. The 10 is perfect. She uses an LM10. I, um, she uses one up every six or eight weeks, and then she starts another one. It shouldn't be a problem. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, anybody else got a question? A bunch of you are unmuted here. Olive, do you have a question? Mm, oh, I'm just listening. Oh, okay, I guess people just got un unmuted. Is there anybody else who has a question? Yes, well, uh, uh, this is Bob Wiskura. Hi, Bob. Uh, great to see you, and I'm sorry I got uh, a situation, a little bit of a medical situation that I was involved in uh, and got in late. Uh, are you going to have this recording available? Uh, yes, it'll be on YouTube. Oh, fantastic. And, 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 and I will be in touch with you, by the way. Uh, what, what little I was able to observe, I'm, I'm, I'm really enthused. Okay, know. great. Marianne, yeah. do you have a question? I see um, you're unmuted. Uh, yes, I do. Um, so your, star, when you, your LM1 pellet, are you purchasing that from a homeopathic pharmacy then? Yes. Okay, and could you do that then with an LM2, LM3, LM4? Yes. yes. Okay. So you can actually buy a supply of one remedy in all the different potencies, and then from that you can make you can make your um, your your liquid uh, bottles for Correct. people. Okay. Now, yeah. Now, for people who want to save money, you can just buy the LM1 and then make the LM2 from the LM1 and make the LM3 from the LM2. What you need for that are um, poppy seed pellets. Poppy seed. Uh, but, uh, and I'm not going to explain it and show it on this um, presentation, but there is, you know, it's in the organon and you can do it yourself. Or you can just buy, um, you know, buy them. For years, I just bought them. Um, but uh, lately, I've been so sometimes making them myself. And there have been times when, uh, because the pharmacies only sell up to LM30, and I've actually had clients um, who've gone beyond LM30, and I've, I've made LM31, LM32, LM33 in a number of remedies. Uh, so, um, you know, it's convenient to know how to do it if, uh, but uh, you certainly can buy them. <clears throat> and I encourage people to support the pharmacies because there are not that many of us LM practitioners out there. So if, if it's easy enough for you to just buy the different potencies, I think that's what you should do. Okay, the other question I have is with your amber glass, the four ounce amber glass that yes. you send out to people, um, Yes. How, how is that different than the uh, the the eight ounce in water? Um, well, it's not four ounces; it's four drams. I'm sorry, four drams. Well, it's it's a lot less water. Okay. So um, so you're basically not doing probably a one to fifty thousand. You might be doing a one to I don't know ten thousand or something. It's oh. not exactly because the one to the LM is really based on the amount of water. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. I just muted someone. Um, so yeah, um, it's it's not going to give you a real one to fifty thousand ratio. Okay, and you've been using that 
for for a long time and that's working well for you I've been using it for decades oh, okay. <laughs> I mean the first few years I did it I did with the whole thing and then I think I think as I mentioned I think it was Robin Murphy who said he was doing it this simpler way and I thought oh, I'm gonna try that sounds easier and I didn't notice any difference um, in results so I just decided to go with the simple the simple way and then you're taking that and just putting the drops into your mouth directly from the bottle then yes uh -huh. okay so there's there's yes. no there's no extra no but it but if you if people need it there can be okay I okay. got it thank you and Linda's asking if we use LMs only for chronic conditions Hahnemann suggests them for um, for chronic oh, and acutes. Yeah. I personally um, tend to um, uh, use C potencies for acutes just because they're easy to get, they're easy to give, they work really fast. Um, but you could, you could definitely use um, LM potencies and Hahnemann says that as well. All right, I'm just looking to see if anybody else is unmuted and wants to ask a question. Um, okay. Well, thank you for joining us and uh, let me know if you have any other questions about anything. You can also check out my YouTube channel. Um, it's just my name, Willa Kaiser. And on that channel, I have a lot of different um, YouTubes on different homeopathic subjects uh, and on healing as well. So thank you very much for joining me.